So what can I say? And what could I do? But offer this heart, oh God. So let's just uh, pray and we'll start, we'll get into worship together. Dear Jesus, just uh, thank you for everyone here and uh, just that uh, we're here to worship you, God, and that we're thankful for this time, God, that we've actually set aside out of our busy lives to give you glory, God. And we pray that we um, do that more often, God, not that it's a legalistic thing, but just that we really do understand what it's like to live a life of praise, God, toward you and that we do experience the freedom in that, God, and that that trickles over into a life, God, that is completely and wholly surrendered to you, God. Um, and so we just take this time, God, and uh, we just dedicate it to you, God, as we do our lives. And we just uh, pray that uh, the words, God, that we sing, um, that we really consider them and that we, um, that we think about what they mean, God, in the picture of our lives, God, and our relationship to you. In Jesus' name we pray.
the stars in the night I wonder At your lightning in the sky I shudder Cause your glory is a blanket that covers every living thing I'm in awe at the majesty of who you are Your love is a seal burning inside my heart And all of the day I just want to be where you are Holy Father And it feels like there's not enough praise inside of me With all these words Oh my heart can sing Is holy You are holy Jesus Christ You bled your love Laid down yourself And gave me in naked shame you hung and you were lifted high So here I lay in awe and wonder Ooh, 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 and I wonder Ooh, 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 ooh and I wonder I'm in awe at the majesty of who you are Your love is a seal that's burned inside my heart And all of the day I just want to be where you are Holy Father And it feels like there's not enough praise inside of me With all these words oh, my heart can sing is only you are holy yeah. Jesus Christ You pledge your love laying down yourself and gave me life in naked shame you hung and you were lifted high So here I lay in awe and wonder I am afraid Cause no one's ever sacrificed and loved me this way So on my face I fall under your heavy grace Here I lay in awe and wonder Sacrificed to love me this way So on my face I fall under your heavy grace Here I lay in awe and wonder Ooh, 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 ooh and I wonder
Thank you, Jesus, that uh, we're in awe of you, God, and that we can't comprehend you. If we could, God, then you wouldn't be God. So uh, help us to keep that childlike amazement, that childlike faith, God, that just is always looking at you in, in awe and wonder, God, of your glory and your goodness that is so far surpasses any human um, thought, God, or any, um, anything that we can even hardly understand God, here on this, on this earth that we live in, in this finite world that we live in, God. We just look forward to, to you, God, to spending eternity with you, God, in heaven in something that we don't even want to try to fathom, God. The goodness of you, God. You're so good to us. And we're so thankful, God, for everything you've given us, God, and trusted us with, God. We just want to give that back to you, God, in any way we can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good afternoon. It's good to see you guys this afternoon. There's uh, only a few of us. It seems like that, um, I think that's summertime and everybody's, uh, everybody's busy. Well, we're small. We're small, but we're strong, right? Because we're here in the presence of the Lord together. So we're going to read our psalm for the afternoon, Psalm 12, beginning with verse 1. To the chief musician, on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them for this gen from this generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen. The title of the message this afternoon is Discouragement That Leads Us to Confidence. Psalm 12. Last week we were in Psalm 11, as you recall, and we came to understand that we always have a choice in life to either to take off and run or stand and fight. Stand up for what the Lord has given us as a conviction from him. In Psalm 12, David is asking the Lord in this prayer, this psalm of prayer, for deliverance from those who are practicing deception. So often as believers, we find ourselves surrounded by people that are practicing deception. That word practicing means that they continually do it for the purpose of perfecting it. There are people who practice deception. What should we do? What should we do? Should we go after them? to straighten them out when we discover they're practicing deception? No, we should do exactly as David did and call out to the Lord for help. Why? Because if we try to do it on our own strength, we will surely fail. What will happen is we will end up tangled up with them in an argument. We'll be tangled up with them in an argument that will, appeal, that will ultimately appeal to our own prideful flesh. The flesh is all about wanting to be right, more than wanting for what is right. As we call upon the Lord for help, the Holy Spirit will invoke us and give us the ability to discern, to discern rightly concerning that which has been spoken. If it's a deception, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. And once we're able to recognize clearly that, that which is deception, we're able then to speak the truth of God's word into that situation. Rather than speaking from our own position and our own opinion, we need to speak God's word into the situation, into the equation. 
David recognizes that he is indeed in a difficult situation when he says in verse 1 that the man of God is gone from the earth. And David is recognizing that so often deception makes its way into our minds when we surround ourselves by people who are practicing evil. Now that's, it's easier said than done to not surround ourselves by these, these people who are practicing evil, amen? We work with them, we live with them, they're, they're everywhere in the world. And Jesus has called us to be in this world, hasn't he? Light and salt, not of the world, but to be in it. And so the question is, what do we do? David, he recognizes that the deception is making its way into the mind of those who are of the Lord because they are surrounded by people who are practicing evil. He's saying, Lord, help me because I find myself in this most dangerous place and I need to move out of this situation and be surrounded by the true worshipers. By true worshipers. Bring on the Shemineth. Bring on the Levites. Bring on the Alamoth. You may ask, what is the Shemineth? Remember back in Psalm 6, we talked about that word, the Shemineth, on Shemineth. And this psalm, as we began, is on an eight-stringed harp, played on an eight-stringed harp. The word Shemineth also refers to a level of worship, the eighth level of worship. Bring on the Levites. We know the Levites were the priestly tribe. Bring on the priests, those who will speak the word of the Lord, and bring on the Alamoth. We'll talk about that later. We hear so much today in the world about the New Age movement, don't we? New Age philosophy, when in fact it's really the Old Age movement. Satan has always appealed to the flesh and he uses the world that we live in as a vehicle. Remember, sin, in order for sin to take place, there has to be the flesh, but there has to be a place for sin to be executed. That's the world. And Satan uses this world to usher in the spirit of the age, the New Age. Which age are we talking about? The very one that we're living in right now, amen? the new age. Satan's goal has always been the same since the old age. His goal has always been the same and is to rid the world of the influence of the righteous, to kill, steal, and destroy, distracting people from listening to the truth of God's word. He doesn't want people to hear the truth of God's word. That's why we have to be careful and not enter into an argument, but rather speak God's word into the situation. How does Satan distract him? distract people he uses the corrupt sinful nature of mankind he uses our own fallen nature doesn't he and the boastful pride of life these are his main tools we can easily become discouraged and certainly we know that david was as he cried out to the lord but what we have to do is remember that the faithful ones still yet remain they are still in the world trusting in the lord These are the people that we should surround ourselves with when we are feeling discouraged. Whenever you find yourself feeling discouraged and down, we should surround ourselves. We should always seek out the counsel of those who belong to the Lord because there are always faithful believers, true worshipers, putting their faith and their trust in the Lord. That's why God's word says in Hebrews that we should never forsake the assembling of ourselves together, as is the practice of of many. I'm thankful for you guys here on Saturday afternoon because we're not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. We're here to hear God's word, amen? Let's read it in Hebrews. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Here's what we do when we're discouraged. We consider one another, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Notice the day in capital D. What day are we talking about? We studied it in Thessalonians, the day of the Lord, the return of the Lord. It's coming quickly. We know in this world that we're looking at today, that we're living in today, in this new age, the spirit of this age right now, the the, the day is coming quickly, isn't it? Remember Elijah? He was discouraged. In his time, he found himself in exactly the same difficult place that David was in, and he cried out to the Lord. What did, what did Elijah say, you recall? What did Elijah say to the Lord in his time of discouragement? Let's read about it, First Kings. So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Was Elijah feeling sorry for himself? He was discouraged, no doubt. And was, were things in a bad state? Yes, they were. 
But he was feeling sorry for himself. He was discouraged, no doubt. What does the Lord respond? What was the Lord's response to Elijah? 1 Kings 19, 18. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The Lord reminded Elijah, didn't he? He reminded him, I have, there's 7,000 that have remained faithful. So often when we become discouraged, we look at the news, we see what's going on around, we've got to remember that the Lord has his faithful followers. We need not be discouraged. We need to come together in the assembly of the believers and be encouraged and built up in our faith. And the lesson for us is that when we have the same mindset, and it's easy, isn't it, to get into that mindset as the prophet Elijah, oh, Lord, I'm by myself in this. We must remember to turn to the Lord. We must remember to seek the fellowship of those who are faithful to the Lord. We need to invite the Shemineth, the, those who are called to the highest of worship, the Alamoth, those who are called to worship, the people who love and know the word of the Lord. If we hold to this lesson, we will, we will, lead our, we will find ourselves being led to repentance and the revival. David was crying out to the Lord for help because he was feeling discouraged. He was in distress because of all the deception that was going on around him. You might say he was feeling sorry for himself as a result. He was asking the Lord to bring down judgment on those who were practicing evil. I want to go back now. I just gave you a brief synopsis. I want to go back to the beginning. Psalm 12, verse 1. David was crying out to the Lord for help, wasn't he? Do you ever feel like that dealing with people has become absolutely impossible? Dealing with people is impossible because you find that you can't believe anything that anyone's telling you. It's like, it's just so discouraging. It's, it's discouraging, isn't it, to come to believe that the vast majority of the people are simply practicing liars. If we don't be careful, we become cynical and skeptical so that we don't trust anyone. We can easily become fatalistic in our thinking because we don't know who to trust. Who can you trust? Who can you trust? The Lord. That you can trust the Lord. The good news is that as we study this psalm today, we're going to discover that in this world, that we are indeed faced with the reality of dishonesty and flattery. However, God has given us his word on which we can depend. We can stake our lives and our hope for the future on his word. We learned in Psalm 10, as you recall, that the wicked were using words to boast with pride and taunt others. We learned last week in Psalm 11 that the wicked were using their words to attack the very foundations of the established government. And even David's advisors were encouraging him to take off and run rather than take a stand. Today, in this psalm today, we're going to see how the wicked use their words of flattery and dishonesty to get whatever they want. The first part of Psalm 12 is a perfect description, if you read it, of the culture that we live in today. People believe that being dishonest and flattering others to get what they want is a perfectly acceptable way to live and to do business. Have you ever heard people say that? Yeah, do whatever you need to do, man, to get ahead. It's all fair. You know, it has become a, a, a model for business today in the world. Say whatever, do whatever. Deception, that's all part. It's all fair game. Listen, flattery is nothing more than the willful, deceitful speech for the sole purpose of personal gain. And King Solomon spoke to us about the issue of flattery in the Proverbs. Proverbs 26, 28. Listen to what Solomon had to say. A lying tongue hates those who are crushed by it, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Solomon goes on in Proverbs 28, 23. He who rebukes a man will find more favor afterward than he who flatters with a tongue. It's better to just give an upfront rebuke to someone than to flatter them, which is a deception. You understand this proverb? Simple, isn't it? But it's so true. Be honest and tell the truth and bring a rebuke to a friend that you love. It's so much more effective than flattery because flattery is nothing more than deceit. Solomon goes on in, in Proverbs 29.5 to tell us, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. You're actually setting a trap for your neighbor when you flatter them. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. And then Daniel, 
the prophet Daniel gave us a clear picture of how the Antichrist will use flattery to rule the world in the end times. Daniel 11.32 Those who do wickedly against the covenant, he shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. Daniel's talking about the end times. Listen to what Jude the brother of Jesus had to say concerning the apostate that would rise in the last days. Jude 16 through 19. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. Spirit with capital S. They do not have the Holy Spirit. We certainly see in the world today those who are fit this description perfectly. But listen, it's so easy for us as believers to forget that we're sanctified. Now, what does sancti sanctified mean? It means we're set apart for holiness. It's so easy to forget that we're set apart for holiness, spirit with a capital S, and we can quickly find ourselves operating in the flesh, becoming those who flatter with tongues for the purpose of self-gain. It's so easy. The flesh wants to be fed, doesn't it? Just like that, it can happen. Charles Stanley, when speaking of the flesh, makes it clear. I just heard him the other day on the radio, and he makes it clear that the flesh is not just the physical skin. No. Not this, not this body that we see, but it's the very desire, our very nature to do our own thing. To take God off the throne and put ourselves in control. That's the flesh. It's the very nature that we have as a result of the fall of man that drives us to continually seek after that which brings self-gain. The flesh. And we're all capable. We're all guilty at times of using flattery and, to dece and deceit to get what we want. This Psalm 12 begins with the superscription. The superscription Sheminith, which was the same word, as I said earlier, that we found in Psalm 6. It's a reference to 1 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 21, and its literal meaning is the eighth division. It's interesting because this title so often is, it refers to the eight strings, but as often in scriptures, there are two meanings to one, one given description, two different meanings. I find this interesting. The reference in 1 Chronicles reveals to us that there was an order of worship that Israel participated in that required them to hold a special place, a special place for righteous worshipers. The description was of those who were completely and totally devoted to worshiping the Lord. They were those who took the call to worship from the Lord in the highest regard. In other words, they were serious about worshiping the Lord. And the connection here in Psalm 12 is that David was calling on the Sheminith. Yes, the eight-string harp, but he was calling on this high order of worshipers because he needed to be surrounded by those who were committed to worshiping the Lord. When you find yourself in a seriously discouraging situation, you need to call out to the true worshipers. Get on the phone and call your friends. Call your pastor. Call those you know in your life to be true worshiper, worshipers of the Lord because they will usher you in. They will bring you in. Remember when David was called in to worship, to bring his heart into worship before Saul, to drive out the tormenting spirits. We've got to realize something, that David wasn't in there playing music for Saul. David was called in to do what? He was called in to play music and worship the Lord. And when we find ourselves surrounded by true worshipers of the Lord, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, drives out the tormenting spirits. They cannot remain in the presence of true worship. Amen? This, this psalm is telling us something. David was calling in the true worshipers of Israel. And whenever we find ourselves crying out to the Lord for help, we should always seek to surround ourselves with those that we are confident are called and are true worshipers. Why? Because we know that the Lord promises that he inhabits the praises of his people. The solution to discouragement is to offer up, offer up to the Lord praise and thanksgiving. That's what true worshipers do. They consistently are offering up an offering to the Lord of praise and thanks for all that he's done. Now remember back in Psalm 6, David concluded that repentance is what was needed. The ravaging work of sin can only 
only ever be stopped by repentance. We have to stop and turn around. We have to repent and give it to the Lord. David's appeal to the Lord in Psalm 12, as we're going to learn today, is a call for revival. Whenever we gather together as the people of the Lord and we worship him as true worshipers in spirit and in truth, we find ourselves called by the Holy Spirit to repent of our sins. And the Holy Spirit then revives in us. He, re he brings a revival in us for the hope that God has given us. The hope for the future. The hope of eternal life. The promise that he's given us. To ever be secure in our relationship with him. Well, today we know that we're living in a corrupt culture, a counterculture, and that culture has crept into the church. It's crept into the church, and it stands to reason that Satan is trying to discourage the church. He's trying to infiltrate the church to infiltrate the church for the purpose of discouraging true worship of the Lord. Why? Because he knows that as we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, true worshipers, the Shemineth, that we will, pour, we will pour out our trust into the Lord. We will trust in his word. And then as a result, we will do that which springs forth from a renewed mind. We'll start doing and acting according to the ways that the Lord would have us act. We will do what Jesus would do. Amen? When we worship in spirit and truth, the Holy Spirit then sanctifies us, sets us apart, and we behave. We find our active free will. We find ourselves choosing to do that which is in line and pleasing to the Lord. That's why Satan wants to discourage true worship. He doesn't want us to be free. He doesn't want us to be free, and he doesn't want us telling others how to be free. He doesn't want us telling us, others to trust in Jesus. That's what David was saying. I'm discouraged, he's saying. My all the deceit and flattery, and as a result of all this evil, he says, I need, you to, I need to bring in the true worshipers. I want to be surrounded by those who understand the high calling of the Lord. I want to be in fellowship with those who put their trust in him. I'm in a desperate need of help from the Lord, and I'm going to find strength that I need with the fellowship of those who are true worshipers. Most Bible scholars believe that this group in First Chronicles called the Sheminith was made up of men. But there was another corresponding group of worshipers called the Alamoth. I told you I was going to come back to that, the Alamoth. And they were mentioned as well in First Chronicles 15.20. This is a group of women a group of women called the Alamoth, and they were mentioned also in Psalm 46, which is associated, Psalm 46 is associated with the Lord being our refuge. These women were true worshipers, representing the refuge that the Lord gives us in our times of struggle. These women were musicians who played the timbrels. If you do a study... I'm going to challenge you. This is your homework assignment. Go back and do a study. Read and study and dig into 1 Chronicles chapter 15. You're going to discover that the Ark of the Covenant was being returned back to Jerusalem. The Ark was going back to Zion, back to Jerusalem from the house of Obed-Edom. Obed -Edom. And there were three distinct groups of worshipers that were participating in escorting the Ark back to Zion. The Levites the Shemineth, and the Alamoth. And what that tells us is that we need to keep the Lord in his rightful place, amen? The ark was going back to Jerusalem to its rightful place. We need to keep the Lord in his rightful place, which is where? Right here. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. We need to recognize that. Set apart for holiness. We are the temple now of the Holy Spirit. We need to keep the Lord in his rightful place by the Levites represent priestly tribe represents the word, the word of the Lord. We need to keep him in his rightful place by studying his word and then by answering the call, his, the highest call to be true worshipers, the Shemineth and the Alamoth. I often talk about the apostate church. We talk about it here on Saturday afternoons. We talked about it when we were in the book of 2 Thessalonians, didn't we? That the, the apostasy must rise in order for the Lord to return. The flattery and the deception of the world has crept into the church. And as a result, we see the apostate church now rising. There's a church out there, isn't there? It's a Laodicean church age that we're living in where Jesus is outside the door knocking. He's not in the, he's not in the center of the worship. He's outside. It's a social gospel, a program of some kind. Well, we see this apostasy rising right now, this false heresy that's being preached even in the churches today. 
And how does it happen? It happens when the church doesn't stay in his word, when we don't stay in alignment with God's word, and when the church does not worship God the Father in spirit and in truth. Of what spirit are we talking about? In spirit and in truth, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. Amen? What truth are we talking about, worshipers? In spirit and in truth, what truth are we talking about? We're talking about Jesus Christ. I am the truth and the way. He is the truth. Amen? We worship in spirit and truth. We worship in the Holy Spirit, which tabernacles in us, keeping him in his rightful place and keeping Jesus as the focus of our worship because it's the finished work of the cross that has saved us. It has restored us back to a relationship with the Father in heaven. Nothing else in this world will ever, ever save us except the finished work of the cross. If we're going to be true worshipers, the Shimoneth and the Alamoth, we have to worship him in Holy Spirit and truth focusing on the finished work of the cross. The apostasy is rising. We see it because the church is wandering away. They're preaching something other than Jesus and him crucified. Remember the apostle Paul resolved to preach nothing but Jesus and him crucified to the Corinthians? When did he do that? After he got all tangled up in Athens talking philosophical nonsense. And so much is written. Be careful when you read the Christian books. The only book that we really need to read is the book. The word of the Lord. You can get caught up in reading this book and people passing around, oh, you got to do this, you got to read that. Be careful. If you're going to read the book, make sure you read it parallel with the word and make sure that everything you're reading is lining up with God's word. Amen? Because the apostasy is certainly rising. We have to be living our lives sanctified, set apart in the truth of the gospel, worshiping him in the Holy Spirit in order to have God the Father in his rightful place. David cries out to the Lord for help and gives us a description of what flattering lips and a deceitful tongue will lead to. Listen now, go back. Psalm 12, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 12, verses 1 through 4. To the chief musician on an eight-stringed harp, a psalm of David. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. Can you imagine? Just cut it off. Ugh. Who have said, this is what they say, this is what the flattering lips say. With our tongue we will prevail. Whatever we say, it goes. Our lips are our own. We're in control. We can say whatever we want to say. Who is Lord over us? Does that sound like the world that we're living in today? I'll tell you what, it sounds like the world, but it also sometimes sounds like the preachers, doesn't it? And it sounds like y'all. It sounds like you, too. I agree. When we get into the flesh, that's exactly what we're saying. We're saying, who's going to prevail over me? I'm, I'm in control. David is asking the Lord in this prayer for deliverance from those who are practicing deception. So often as believers, we find ourselves, as I said earlier, surrounded by people practicing deception. The question now, again, I'm going to pose to you is what should we do? What should we do? Go after them to straighten them out? We become guilty of this very same infraction. The very same infraction. We, we say, who is Lord over us? We, 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 the people don't see the Lord. They see us. They see us in this argument, in this debate. And the David did exactly what it is that we should do. He called out to the Lord for help. Because whenever we try to do it in our own strength, we will surely fail. We need to call on the Lord for help. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to invoke within us the ability. Give us the wisdom, Lord, to discern that which is, is right and which is in line with your word. And once we're able to recognize clearly that which is deception, because the Holy Spirit will give it to us. He'll reveal to us what deception is are being spoken. Then we speak his word. We speak his word into the situation. And that's what David did. He recognized that he was in a difficult place. He's, he's crying out from a place of discouragement. Where's the faithful ones? Where's the holy ones? Where's the man of God? Is he gone from the earth? David is recognizing that he's surrounded by all this deception. And he recognizes that, that's, that this deception around can get into your mind. But he's saying, Lord, help me. I'm in the dangerous position. Bring on the Shemineth. Bring it on. 
Bring on the Levites. Bring on your word, Lord. And bring on the, the, the women who worship with the timbrel. Bring on the men, the Shimonites, the higher worshipers. And so we hear, and we hear the talk, don't we? In the church today, we hear it about the new age. But it really is old age. It's the original deception in the garden, and Satan's still doing exactly the same work that he would do. The lesson for us is that when we have the same mindset we talked about earlier as the, as the prophet Elijah, when we get into that feel sorry for ourselves mindset because of, we're discouraged. David was there. He was doing the same thing, wasn't he? When we get into that mindset, we have to remember to turn to the Lord, to cry out to him for help, and to seek the fellowship of those who are faithful to the Lord. We've got to invite in the true worshipers. Amen. And David believed in God, too. He believed in God. David was a realist, wasn't he? He was a realist. In his discouragement, he said something. He said, man, the man of God has gone from the earth. He was discouraged. He knew that the man of God wasn't gone from the earth. He was just expressing his deep discouragement. But he was a realist because he also knew, he also said that he knew that the man of guile, the man of evil and deceitful, flattering lips, was here on the earth. Psalm 12, verses 2 through 4, they speak idly, everyone with his neighbor. He's acknowledging that they're here. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things who have said, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? He described this, this group perfectly. He, he's being very, very much a realist here. And while we know that David was discouraged, he wasn't delusional because he gave us a description, an accurate description of these people that he was surrounded by. And he talked about how they disobey God with their tongues and how they gain power through flattery and deception and other wicked schemes. Do we see that going on in the world today? Constantly. So what do we do? We become discouraged. We, we want to be a realist. We want to see it for what it is. But in our discouragement, what we need to remember is do, to do what David did and cry out to the Lord for help and then surround ourselves with true worshipers. It's a fact. We can be discouraged, no doubt. God doesn't expect us to not be discouraged at times, but he expects us to understand clearly why we are discouraged and exactly what it is that he wants us to do when we are discouraged. We just have to make sure that we make the right choice. We have to be operating from a renewed mind. We have to make the right choice to surround ourselves with the people of the Lord and to go to his word when we're discouraged. David was tired. We know that, don't we? From all the studies we've been doing, he's been running for his life. He's been hiding from Saul. He's been hiding from Absalom. David is tired. He's even been told by his own advisors, man, David, this over, man. The foundations of the very cult, it's all destroyed. Everything's done. You need to run for the hills. But instead, David said, no, I'm going to stand and fight. I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. He knew that he was a realist. He knew that the only way he could ever win this battle that he was in was to put his trust in the Lord. He was tired. He was discouraged, and he was tired from running, from flight. Remember in Psalm 11, remember in Psalm 11, he decided to take a stand and to fight. And the question is, how does David fight? How does he fight? Here in Psalm 12, he cries out to the Lord and he recognizes that he doesn't have the strength within himself to fight. It's over. He has to give it to the Lord. Help. I'm discouraged. I'm at the end of it all. Help, Lord. Send in the people, of the, of the, your people, your true worshipers. I need help. It's, you know, it's so often as believers, we have this pride thing that keeps us from calling out to one another for help when we're struggling. Instead, we just think, I'm just going to keep on trudging on and I'm going to get through this. And it's not true. We need to call on the people of the Lord when we find ourselves discouraged. How does David fight? He doesn't do it out of his own strength. No, he calls on the Lord. All he had left at that time was a choice to make. And in his spirit, he was willing. He became willing to exercise his free will and choose to say, I'm at the end of it. Help me, Lord. What happens when we fight it in our own strength? We know, don't we? We've seen this so many times in our own lives, in the, in the life of the church. We see it in the people fighting against the enemy. The enemy comes in, gets people in the church fighting with one another. It never ends well, does it? 
Mm -mm. Satan ends up a victor. He gets a trophy. He, 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 he breaks hearts. He hurts people. Fighting, fighting in our own strength, it feeds our flesh, doesn't it? It feeds our flesh, the desire to be in control, and it sets the stage for division. That's what the apostate church is all about, division, strife. The enemy filtering into the church and taking us away from the truth of God's word. We become just like the Laodicean church where everything is a, the focus is on everything other than putting our trust completely and totally in Jesus. And David recognizes that these flattering and deceitful lips that he's talking about, he's recognizing that these men are all over the world, but he also recognizes that the Lord will take care of them. He recognizes that the Lord will take up the battle, that the Lord will cut off. He will cut off the flattering lips and deceitful tongues. And amazing, you don't do much talking. Talking comes to an end when the tongue's cut off. And that's what David acknowledges. And now David's going to speak to us concerning the assurance that he has, concerning the Lord's work and his judgment on those who are coming against him. He's confident. He's assured. He has assurance and confidence that the Lord is going to come against those that are attacking him. Psalm 12, verses 5 through 6. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will arise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety for which he yearns. He's just telling us something. He's saying the Lord's just speaking to him. The Lord's speaking this to him now. Because he's sighing, isn't he? He's coming from a position. Is he poor and needy, King David? He's recognizing his, his, his poverty, isn't he? In the Beatitudes, the, 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 Jesus taught us that blessed are the poor in spirit. We've got to recognize our, our true state. David's the king. David's the king of Israel. Where is he? Hiding in a cave running for his life. He recognizes the situation that he's in. Without the Lord, you have nothing. Where's your, what's your palace doing for you now, David? He's recognizing that truth. And he's saying something. He's assured of God's deliverance on his life. The words of the Lord are pure words. Notice this verse just follows after that promise that, he, that the Lord gave him. Like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. He's saying, that I can trust the word of the Lord right here. What the Lord is telling me is that he hears the oppression. He sees the oppression of the poor, and he hears the sighs of the needy. And he says, I will arise. We have to always remember that when we become discouraged, when we become discouraged by all the atrocities that are going on in the world around us, that the Lord's word is pure. Things didn't look good for David, but the Lord gave him an assurance that was a guarantee. The Lord told him, my words, David, lean on my words because they have been tried in the furnace. The assurance that David experienced began with the, his prayer to the Lord as he cried out for help. He says in verse 5, for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of me, David goes on. He's recognizing that the Lord sees. The Lord sees. The Lord knows the condition that he's in. And no matter how powerful our enemy appears to be, when we call out to the Lord in our times of need, our Heavenly Father hears His children and responds. How easily we forget who we are and what a Savior we have in Jesus. Amen? We forget. The Scripture tells us that no weapon fashioned against us will stand. Why? Because any weapon that is formed against us is against Jesus because we are his children. If you come against my children, you're going to have to come against me. When we come, whenever the enemy tries to come against us as his children, the scripture says no weapon will ever prosper against us. Why? Because you're coming against Jesus. We belong to Jesus, and the victory has already been won. Death couldn't hold him in the grave. Victory's already been won. Death is defeated, amen? And at times we are discouraged by the things of the world that are going on. The enemy, Satan, the author of secular humanism and pluralism and materialism and every other ism and schism and everything that comes against the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does it mean to us? We are in Christ. What does it mean to us? According to Peter, what are we? You guys, we were there together. What are we? We're a royal priesthood, a holy nation of people, chosen people, chosen by God. We belong to the Father who created everything and we have to try to get this truth into perspective whenever we face times of discouragement. If we believe we're living in the end times today, we say we do. 
if we believe that we're quickly approaching the end of the age of grace, and we believe we are, if we believe in the, that the fullness of the Gentiles is soon to come in, we'd be like the Thessalonians and have a sense of urgency about witnessing the, the name of Jesus to everyone so that that fullness would come in so that the Lord would return. We certainly see the apost apostasy rising. We see heresy being preached. Then we should, we should expect this, shouldn't we, as we look around. We should expect deception and flattery to prevail in this world. And if all of these things are true, and we believe them to be true, then the question is, what should be our response? What should our response be as believers? The things of this world may very well drive us, very well drive us to our knees, just like with David. They may very well drive us to our knees, crying out to the Lord for, for help. But, 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 as believers, we should expect that the Lord will answer with his pure words, that he will send revival, that he will tear down the strongholds, that he will cut off the lips of those who are practicing deception. When we cry out to him for help, do we expect it? Do we expect him to do just exactly what his word says he'll do? We need to live that way. We need to live like we believe that to be true. We need to live like the Thessalonians and have a sense of urgency about telling the truth about the freedom that comes in Jesus to those that we see around us that are in bondage. Those who are speaking words of flattery and deception are in bondage. We need to speak the truth to them that they might be delivered from the deception of the enemy. We can remain oppressed and we can continually sigh, but we don't have to because we are guaranteed by the Lord that he will fight our battles. David declares this guarantee. He declares this guarantee in verse 6, Psalm 12, 6. Listen to this. He guarantees the victory. The, Lord, the words of the Lord are pure words. Here's the guarantee like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times, just absolutely perfect. He's putting his trust in the Lord. You've heard it said that a man is only as good as his word, and we believe that to be true, don't we? Question, how good is the Lord? The question is, how good is the word of the Lord? Do we believe it? That's what David was saying. It's my guarantee. The word of the Lord. He is good and his word is good. That's my guarantee. It's our guarantee, isn't it? For victory, because victory is always, always based on the word of the Lord. And the word is truth. The word is Jesus. Amen? The word is his truth because the word is Jesus. David gives us a contrast now as we close up. He gives us a contrast of the word of the Lord, which he just said is pure, to those who are the workers of iniquity. Psalm 12, verses 7 through 8. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. He's talking about those who put their trust in him. The wicked prowl on every side. Here's the contrast. When vileness is exalted among the sons of men. They're prowling around when? When vileness is being exalted. Are we living in a culture where vileness is being exalted? People flocking tonight, this very night, while we're here just diving into the word of the Lord, the theaters are full of people who are watching and paying for entertainment that does exactly what this verse says. Vileness being exalted among the sons of men. Wicked, prowling on every side. There's a huge contrast, isn't there? between the words of the Lord and the, and the words of the wicked. Truth is always the solution. Jesus is always the answer. His word is always the answer. We need to speak his word into the equation. When there's discouragement, we need to speak his word. When there's discouragement, we need to seek the counsel of true worshipers. Call in the Levites. Call in the Shemineth. Call in the Alamoth. Bring the, the Holy Spirit in. The worship of him in spirit and in truth. Holy Spirit leading us, pointing us back to Jesus, the answer, the truth. It's always the antidote for the deception. And the enemies of David were deceivers. And the devil, in these times, that's the tool that he uses, isn't it? He's using the tool of deception in these times to lead people to what they consider to be the good life, the great American dream, the right to happiness, entitlement, if you don't believe it, just look at what, pe what people are going through, this next generation with Facebook. They look on the Facebook. They see the wonderful life that someone else has. 
which is nothing more than deception. The people taking the pictures and posting them, they're not posting their, their times when they're in their room crying because they realize they have no friends. What they're posting on Facebook is a picture and a depiction that's a deception of their life. This is what, this is, what is going on in our culture today. This is what's going on. David goes from discouragement to confidence. Here's the portion of David's confidence here. He knows that he is kept, that he is safe, that he is preserved forever. We just read it. Go back to verse 7. You shall keep them. David is saying, you're going to keep them. When something is kept, that means it's safe. And what David is recognizing is that as he puts his trust in the Lord and cries out to him, that he is kept, that he is safe, he's preserved. Oh, Lord, you shall preserve them from this generation forever. Do we need to worry about the, the, the deceptions and the, and, the, and the things that are going on? No, because we're kept. As believers, we are kept and we are preserved forever. doesn't matter. Are we going to be... Are we going to be attacked by the enemy? Are we going to be marked? Are we going to be stigmatized? Are we going to be marginalized? Are we going to be beaten? Are we going to be... The, we have Christian brothers and sisters across the world right now that are giving their lives for the gospel. I believe in America, we're going to see more persecution rising. And you know what? The persecution that came in the early church is what spread the gospel message. God used the persecution of his people to spread the good news across the whole entire world. So even so, Lord, we've, in America, we have adopted an easy believism. We're at one time being an American is synonymous with being a Christian. It isn't true. But let us be Christians right now that are confident. Let's be like David. Let's cry out to the Lord for help, no doubt. Let's be realist. When we find ourselves discouraged because of what's going on around us, let's cry out to the Lord for help, making sure that we do call in his word. Call in the Levite to usher the Holy Spirit into his rightful place, making sure that by his word we check what it is that we say. And as we respond to people, that we respond in love. Truth in love. Truth. That we bring Jesus into the equation, that we speak the truth. That's where our confidence needs to be. We need to put on the full armor of God because that's our security. Why do we need the full armor of God? Why do we need the full armor of God? Because the enemy is ever a roaring lion looking to, to, to attack and defeat, discourage, to kill, steal, and destroy. The faithful haven't vanished from this earth, have they? No. Sometimes we feel like, well, what's going on? They're here. Let's learn from Elijah. Let's learn from David. In our times of discouragement, Let's call out to the Lord for help and let's call in the true worshipers of the Lord because we find our strength and our encouragement in the fellowship of believers. The church of Jesus Christ will be triumphant because he does the work of washing us white as snow. Amen? Nothing we can do. It's all about the finished work of the cross. It's already completely done. Let's live in that. Let's live victorious lives. Let's live in the victory that Jesus has given us by his finished work of the cross. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you. We thank you that we do live in a time right now, Lord, when we believe that you're coming back soon, Lord. We, we look around us and we see the end times prophecies being fulfilled. And we just pray that that would, would, would cause us, Lord, to, to press, to press in on you, Jesus to answer the call that you've given us, to walk in the good works you've prepared for us. Lord, to, to be a sanctified church, holy and spotless, Lord, to, to be a witness for you, Lord. Help us in our times of discouragement. We're realistic people, Lord. We live in a world where we are going to be discouraged, but help us during those times to do like David did and to cry out to you for help, Lord, and to surround ourselves with a fellowship of believers, true worshipers, so that we might keep you, Lord, in your rightful place, that we might be effective witnesses for you, that we might not go into the realm of the flesh, Lord, get in, getting involved in the arguments and the nonsense and the boastful pride of life and everything that, that, that the enemy wants us to, to do, Lord. Keep us from the deceiver and help us to know, Lord, that with confidence you keep us, Lord, that that which you have, have redeemed, you're able, Lord. You are able to finish the work that you've started in each one of us to keep us and preserve us for the day when you will call us home. 
so that we might be glorified, Lord, that we might find the last part of our salvation when we are truly delivered from the presence of sin. And we look forward to that day. And we know, Lord, that it's coming soon. And we just pray, Lord, even so that you would return. But until you do, Lord, as your children, Lord, we call on you for the strength that we need to be a witness to lost people. When they speak flattering words, Lord, when they speak deceptions, that we would speak you, the truth, into their lives and come to realize that whatever it is that they say, whatever it is that they do, has no power over us. Give us confidence, Lord, in the finished work of the cross. We just pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, everyone. Anybody have any special prayer requests today? All is well.